Well, that's taken a really long time. All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope. And uh, we are doing a Monday night uh, Bible Q&A, and I have my both of my wingmen here with me today, uh, Brother Justin Whitland and Brother Mike Basile. And we're going to do our best to try to give you Bible answers for the questions that uh you you all have asked last week and we had this week uh some time to study up on the answers to the questions and i just like to open up with this um you could have all your questions answered but what good will it do if you will not respond to the truth of the real question that needs to be asked where will your soul spend eternity and if you don't know where your soul will spend eternity and you haven't objectively answered that question about uh, how can you get your sins forgiven? How can you gain eternal life? How can you be made right with God? Then uh, you are doomed to a devil's hell because uh, God doesn't send people to hell because, you know, they just don't know anything at all. Uh, people are in hell because they, they reject the light that God has given them. So what we're trying to do is uh, give you the ultimate fog light, so to speak, and shine it in your face, the fog light of the gospel, the fog light that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And if you would believe and trust in that ultimate light, that God would give you eternal life, reconciliation to himself and forgiveness of sins. What a great gift that God offers us. Why don't we respond to that big fog light shining in our face and say, you know what? It's really bright. But now if I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I can truly see what my life is all about. I can truly see purpose for living. And what a great thing that you can have by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. So um, oh, I'm going to go ahead and let, uh, we're going to go in order. I'm going to let Justin open up first and I'm going to let Mike open up and then we'll we'll go ahead and get started after they open up. Okay, go ahead, Brother Justin. Sure. Thank, thanks, Brother Ed. Thanks uh, again for having me on. Thanks for those that participate. Uh, you know, now that we, we have covered the gospel, I would like to say this. Uh, for those of you that uh, are saved, I would encourage you to witness to people uh, in Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them about the salvation that you have. And uh, if they have questions, encourage them to ask. We certainly would welcome uh, questions from some unbelievers, which uh, I'm sure there are some. I just believe that a lot of our questions come from uh, some brothers and sisters in the Lord, which always appreciate those as well. But uh, see if we can help reach some lost people with that. Uh, I know I had questions when I was lost, and it certainly helped me to come to the Lord getting some of those things answered or looked at or considered. And uh, so that's that's my admonition for today. Well, I would just reinforce hey, man. that. Okay, Brother Mike. Yeah, I would reinforce mm -hmm. that, just saying that, like Brother Ed said, we can answer your questions. We can answer every single one of your questions. But if you reject Jesus Christ, if you reject the calling to him, if you reject what he is wanting you to do, you're going to die and go to hell. And the most important question we can ask you is, what will you do with Jesus? Amen. Amen. Appreciate it, Brother Mike. And um, we'll go ahead without further ado, and we will get started on our questions here. So um, let's go ahead and let me get these up on the screen here. And I've kind of figured out uh, how to work this with all three of us on the screen. Um, get into the Bible Q&A questions section here. Now, the first question is going to come from Jose Navarro, and it should show up on your screen right now. And the question is, is it biblical to be cremated or is it a pagan practice? Is it biblical to be cremated or is it a pagan practice? So we'll go ahead and we'll start off with Brother Justin. We'll just keep going down the road like this. Go ahead, brother, if, if you want to go ahead sure. and go. Sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks for asking the question. And uh, 
I guess we'll start with this. We'll get a couple of places in the Bible tonight. Take a look at it. Genesis chapter number three to start. Genesis chapter number three. The Bible says in verse number. Let's see. We'll go to 17, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, that's the Lord, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Amen. You are nothing but dust. Whether you get put in a box, you <laughs> become dust over a long period of time, or you're put in a fire and you become dust in a very short period of time, you're nothing but dust. It doesn't, I, I would tell you my perspective on this, when looking at the Bible is, is it really doesn't matter uh, what happens to the body. Let's get, uh, while we're in the Old Testament, get Job, the book of Job. Let's go there, chapter 19. Book of Job, chapter 19. And the Bible says in verse number 26, uh, well, we can't pass up 25. you got to read that while we're here. Verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. See what Job said? I know that my Redeemer Amen. liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Praise God. Looking for that day when he stands again upon the earth. He's been here once. He'll come again uh, soon enough in his own time. Verse number 26, and though... Amen. After my skin, worms destroy this body. Amen. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. So you could let worms Amen. destroy your body and then the worms scatter it across the earth. And God knows where you are. If you remember, even the hairs of your head are numbered. God will have no problem putting you back together if you're saved in the day when it comes to stand before him uh, at the judgment seat of Christ or putting you back together to stand before him at the great white throne judgment before he casts your soul and body in the lake of fire. Now, um, let's get another place, another place, two more places. We'll try and wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. And look over to verse number 37, uh, verse 36. And others, talking about the, the great roll call of faith. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, <coughs> were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So I would point to martyrs. I would point to martyrs. You have Polycarp was recorded as having been burned to death. You have Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, and I know, you know, everybody, he's, he, he wasn't part of the whole King James thing, but he was, he, was, he was a very important figure in the Reformation, breaking away from Roman Catholicism, bringing light to, out, of, out of a dark place. And William Tyndale, William Tyndale burned at the stake. And you could read Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's lots of them. Lots of God's people have been burned at the stake. You can't say that that's something good or positive or, I mean, bad or in either case. It doesn't matter. In fact, uh, let's, get, let's get John 6. I didn't go there yet. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. 
because because this is ultimately what I'm trying to get to. John chapter six, verse sixty three, uh, says, "It is the spirit that quickeneth; the flesh profiteth nothing." You see that the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak in you, they are spirit and they are life. The body doesn't mean anything. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This thing is going to either rot and become dust over a long period of time. You put it in a fire, it becomes dust in a very short period of time. But in either case, this thing is going to decay. It is going to rot. It is going to become nothing but dust on the earth. Until the day, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll close with this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse number 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. You see that? And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, this body, which is corruptible, must put on incorruption. I'm getting rid of this thing anyway. I'm going to get a new and glorious body like, like in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There it is. There it is. The flesh and the blood, the, the body doesn't profit you anything. What you should do is give your body to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Give of your life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And when it dies, when you die... It's going to fall apart anyway. It didn't really matter too much. God was able to use it for a little bit of time. And then he'll put it back together in a new and glorious fashion. And it will be incorruptible. Amen. Hey, Amen. Oh. Appreciate that, Brother Justin. All right. Uh, pass over to, to Brother Mike. Go ahead, Brother. What you got on this? Well, the Bible doesn't really say a lot about cremation at all. It doesn't really give you any specific commands on which way you should be buried at all. Um, there is a few references, a few places in the Bible where it talks about people being burned. I'm going to go through a couple of those just for a Bible study. Um, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 18, and it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken and he went into the palace of the king's house and he burnt the king's house over him with fire and he died. 2 Kings 21, 6, and he made his son pass through the fire and observed the times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And those are instances of people being burned. Uh, and there's also some instances of, of human bone being burned. Go to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 16. Um, and as Josiah himself turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it. According to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words? I find it very interesting that when the bones were burned on the altar, the altar was polluted. Not saying that it's, it's wrong to be cremated, but it's definitely wrong to offer a human sacrifice to our God. Um, you you got to keep things in perspective. Burning bones on the altar desecrated that altar. Now, at the same time, Old, Old Testament law nowhere commanded that a deceased body had to be burned or had not to be burned. It doesn't attach any curse to it. It doesn't attach any judgment to it. To anybody who's cremated, it's pretty much a, a, a property. Now, cremation was practiced in the biblical times. I did a, a, a word search on a study on it. Um, it it was not commonly practiced by the Israelites or by New Testament believers. Um, in the culture of Bible times, burial was in a tomb or a cave or in the ground. That was a common way of disposal of a body. You have Genesis 23, 19, 35, 19, 2 Chronicles 16, 14, Matthew 27, 60 to 66. Now, while burial was common practice, the Bible nowhere commands burial as a way of disposing the body. Um, Babylonians burned their dead and deposit their ashes in a funeral urn. The Greeks did the same thing. The Romans did the same thing. The Hebrews in later time 
Um, it's indicated by the various and numerous ossuaries that were found. They did it as well. They practiced cremation. But again, the Bible, there's no specific scriptural command against or for creation. Some believers objected to the fact of creation um, because they believe that one day God will resurrect our bodies and have to re reunite our bodies. Like Justin said, someone has been buried for a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years, they're dust. And someone that's cremated is dust today. God is not going to have any problem putting my body back together no matter how long I've been gone. If someone's been gone for 6,000 years, God knows exactly where they are. Cremation does nothing but expedite the process of turning us to dust. God is equally able to raise me from the dead if I get buried in a cave or a mausoleum or in the ground. It's just as easy for him to put me back together whose ashes were spread across the sea. So the question of um, cremation is within the realm of Christian freedom. Um, if you're thinking about it, consider it. Um, pray for wisdom. Uh, James 1.5, pray for wisdom. And then follow the conviction that God gives you on this. Again, absolutely no commandments, one way or the other, about cremation. All right. Appreciate that, Brother Mike. And I guess it is my turn. Um, I would say that uh, certainly this topic can cause division uh, to those that are weaker brethren in the faith, and they would divide over such matters as uh, trivial things such as this that are not clearly stated in the Bible. And what a shame that uh, our focus would be on these trivial things aside from what Ephesians uh, tells us to do as we are in Christ in whom uh, we have trusted and our fellowship should be in Christ. Our fellowship should be in the cross work of Christ. But so many weaker brethren would like to argue about these trivial things and cause a division and cause discord among the brethren. What a shame uh, that is that people would do uh, such things. So uh, what I'll do is I'll cover this thing, but I, I do want to stress that uh, if you disagree with things that I say, that's fine. I mean, you don't have to agree with me. Um, I'm going to show you some Bible verses. Um, I, I'd rather be persuaded of Bible verses than my own opinion or my pastor's opinion or the congregation's opinion. I want to I be persuaded by the Bible. And that way, when I stand before God, I can say, God, I believe your word. I mean, that's what I would like to say. What about you? I'll, I hope that's it's like that, that with you too. So um, Justin had covered this in Genesis 3.19. Um, he says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, how we become that dust, as Mike just said earlier, I mean, the result is going to be dust, whether you're burning or whether you're decaying. The result is going to be dust. But I believe that uh, the the argument poses from, and uh, and this argument comes from, I, I think just people that are not, re they're, they're reading too much in between the lines. Um, they're, they're zooming in so much where they're actually um, going into heresy. They're going into a ditch. And, and I think one of them is, didn't Jesus die on a cross and then he was buried he wasn't cremated. He was buried and then rose again a third day, right? So they pose the example of Jesus. We are to walk in Jesus' steps. And then they, they actually make it a doctrine to say, well, if Jesus was buried, then the Christian life should be, if we die, we should be buried. And I, now that's, I've heard the argument, okay? And then there's another argument that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So if the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and you burn the body, then somehow you are defiling what God has created in as, as the Christian, you know? And so I've heard these arguments. And let's just look at a few of these things and I'll refute. Uh, some of these ideas being dogmatic. I mean, certainly you can have some ideas about this. I don't think it's sinful to kind of think about, you know, what Jesus did and how he died. He was buried. I don't see nothing wrong if you want to get buried and you're persuaded to get buried. But I just think it's wrong if you want to make it a doctrinal issue. You're not right with God if somebody decides to get cremated because 
they can't afford a burial or for their own personal reasons. You know, you know, I mean, I mean, it could be a countless number of reasons why they would want to do what they do in cremation. So one reason why Abraham buried the dead was go to Genesis 23, 3. Genesis 23, 3. And Abraham stood up and Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you. Now watch that. I may bury my dead out of my sight. What's a good reason to uh, bury the dead? That the dead would be out of your sight. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going by the Bible, okay? That's one reason right there, okay? Let, let, let's keep going. It was important for Jews to be buried by their people and family. Genesis 47, 29. Genesis 47, 29, go there. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, but I pray thee thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. Now, a, a, a person could get could get dogmatic. I mean, if you want to get dogmatic about burying, couldn't you get dogmatic about not being not being buried in Egypt? If you're an Egyptian Christian, you'd say, "Well, I don't want to get buried in Egypt because I got a verse in Genesis forty-seven twenty-nine that we shouldn't be buried in Egypt. <laughs> we need to be buried amongst the Jews." <laughs> so everybody in America that's a Christian is going to be buried in Israel. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, you got to get practical, guys. Get practical. Um, rightly divide the word of truth. I mean, anybody can take some verses and pull them out of context and get dogmatic about them. So let's let's rightly divide. Let's be let's be reasonable about the scriptures here. The word buried, buried, that's spelled B-U-R-I-E-D, is used 97 times in the Old Testament. Here we see the Jews and Gentiles bury the dead, even the wicked people, in Numbers 11. And 34 and Numbers 33, 4. It says in Numbers 11, 34, that the Israelites that sinned were buried. In Numbers 33, 4, the Egyptians buried their dead. So is, is burying the dead a pagan practice from the Egyptians? <laughs> Don't bury the dead. <laughs> See, you can you can formulate all these arguments. You're always there's gonna be a verse in the Bible that's gonna contradict your doctrine if you want to be dogmatic about burial or cremation. You better be careful. In the New Testament, buried is buried, that's spelled B-U-R-I-E-D, is only used nine times. The question against cremation would be, did New Testament saints get buried or cremated, right? Wouldn't that, come on, that's that's where we're, we're going, right? The only thing we learn from scripture is that when a saved person died, they buried them, but never there, listen, there was never a rebuke or correction or a law concerning cremation or disposal of a corpse. And Justin and, and Mike had said that a minute ago. Old Test the Old Testament uh, word burying, okay, it's used to 2 Kings 13, 21 and Ezekiel 39, 12. The New Testament, in the New Testament, the word burying is used two times, Mark 14, 8, John 12, 7, concerning Jesus being buried. Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the word bury is used 39 times. In the New Testament, the word bury is used six times. The first time buried concerning a person is mentioned, God is speaking to Abram. Abram is a Gentile, Ur of the Chaldees. He practiced burying. I wonder where he learned burying from. Probably from a bunch of other Gentiles that were burying. So it's not only a Christian practice. It's not, it, come on. We're talking about dead people. The soul and the spirit are gone out of the corpse. And people are arguing about a corpse. <laughs> Let's not argue about that. Let's worry about the soul that's within the corpse. That would be better. I'm not arguing about dead things. Dead things are, what was it? The dead things in the sea. Was that Joe passage? <laughs> we, let's not worry about, let's not argue about those things. So, Mike said it earlier. 
about the cremation. Um, in 1 Samuel 31, 12, in 1 Samuel 31, 12, look at this one. 1 Samuel 31, 12, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. Now watch, and they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. And David sent messengers unto the men of uh, Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye uh, of the Lord that ye have showed his kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. Now, was he burnt or was he buried? Which one was right? Well, how about both? <laughs> What do you do if they're they're burnt and then they're buried? <laughs> Come on, which one's right? Now go to Jeremiah eight two. Go to Jeremiah eight two. Not being buried seems to have some sort of link to shame. The Lord is speaking in these passages. Look at Jeremiah chapter eight verse two. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented. Neither shall they be buried. Stop right there. Because you go to you can go to Jeremiah 16, 6, they shall not be buried. Uh 2 Kings 9, 10, and there shall not, and there shall be none to bury her. So it seems as if that to not be buried in the eyes of God is kind of linked to shame. Just have your body out in the open to rot in front of every to stink up anybody that's near that body. Um, there's just some shame in that, okay. That's what God is saying right there in those passages. Now, look at this one. In the Old Testament, burying of the dead after someone was hanged on a tree um, will keep the land undefiled. Deuteronomy 21, 22. Look at this one. Deuteronomy 21, 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death or and he be to be put to death and thou shalt hang him on a tree his body shall not remain all night upon the tree but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day for he that is hanged is cursed accursed of god that thy land be not defiled which the lord thy god giveth thee for an inheritance so you see that burying of the dead after someone was hanged on a tree will keep the land undefiled so so there's some things that are exclusively for the Jews right there that God has told the, the Jew. And you've got better be careful to apply that to you because it's talking about burying. See that? Now, in the tribulation, burying of the dead enemies is linked to cleansing the land of Israel. Ezekiel 39, 11. Or let's go to verse 12, Ezekiel 39, 12. And I would like you to read uh, 11 as well if you want to get the context of everything. And seven months uh, shall the house of Israel be burying of them, and they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. So just a few verses there. Read the context. You'll see that it is in the tribulation time. The burying of the dead enemies is linked to the cleansing of the land of Israel. See, you're not Israel. I'm not Israel. We are not living in Israel right now. Uh, Israel is not replaced with America. So this is exclusively to the nation of Israel. Now, live cremation in the Old Testament for Jews uh, is considered capital punishment, death by fire. A uh, man takes a wife and her mother in Leviticus 20, verse 14. Look at this one, Le Leviticus chapter 20, verse 14. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. <laughs> there's a law for burning somebody right there, right? Both he and they, and there, that there be no wickedness among you. Priests, daughters, play, uh, play the whore right here in Leviticus 21, 9. Look at this one. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. Look at Achan. 
Gideon was punished for his sin in Joshua 7.25. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. If God doesn't want anybody burnt with fire, then why is he using it as a capital punishment in the Israelite law? <laughs> Come on, get to answer that. The Bible makes it clear it's not what we do concerning death and the decisions we make concerning the grave that we are worried about, but what we do and the decisions we make while we are yet still alive. Ecclesiastes 9:10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Why are you worried about the grave? Why are you worried about knowledge of the grave? Let's worry about what our souls are right now while we're yet alive. The Bible never gives instructions on how one should make arrangements for the dead, the body concerning the body and the corpse, but gives us the fact that we are dust and dust we will return no matter what goes on in between the argument that the body is holy and we already mentioned that one first corinthians 6 19 uh the argument that the body is holy and that you should respect the holy temple of god by bearing your body could pull you into two um to two different views and i'm you know we're not going to cover that too much but um when you die is your body still the temple of the holy ghost that's the question i'd like to ask you if that's the direction you're going down if you're reasoning that way when you die, your corpse, the ground, is that corpse the temple of the Holy Ghost? No, it's not. The soul is left. The spirit has went back to God. The body is worm food. See that? All right. And then I think Justin did a great job on that 1 Corinthians 15. So in conclusion, is it, it is a matter of preference how a person wants to be dealt with concerning his own body at death. And there is nothing in the Bible that we can be objective and dogmatic about concerning bearing versus cremation. We know that people were buried and we know that people were cremate, cremated. There was no rebuke for either or. OK, so there it is. Just some verses to think about. OK, so I think that's good. Um, if anybody's got anything else to add, uh, be my guest. Mm -hmm. Just one one statement I will make because I know we'll probably get an email on it. Though Wycliffe wasn't burned to death, he burned after his death, right? They un they brought up his bones, buried his bones because they thought that might do something. So anyway, just wanted to pop, pop that one in there before somebody sends an email saying uh, Wycliffe wasn't, wasn't burned. <laughs> All right. Amen. All right. I guess we'll go to the next one then. Um, next question here uh, from Deb Shaughnessy. So let me uh, put that on the screen here from Deb Shaughnessy. Um, good morning, Brother Ed and Justin. And I guess you can include Mike as well. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain two things. Uh, one, Nicolaitanism in general. In Revelation 2.6, God says he hates them. So why do so many pastors still recognize today as Jesus's resurrection? And I guess that was around, I guess, Easter time when, when she asked the question. And then for point two, she says, is it true that Jesus was really born in August and not December? My 19 year old son had read somewhere. He can't remember where that Jesus was born in August. Maybe you can give us some clarity on that. So I guess we'll just keep going down here. Uh, go ahead, brother Justin. All right. So um, to start with, with regards to Nicolaitan, um, there, there is no definition of the word given in the Bible. Uh, however, I can see two things on it. So number one, the when you break down the words Nico and Lai, Nico means victory or victorious or to conquer, and Lai, laity, that's the common people. So having a a mix of of the congregation, some as clergy, if you will, that rule over the laity, if you will, that's one possibility. Um, and certainly God hates that. Certainly God despises that. If you're saved, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're, if you're saved, we are kings and priests unto God. Now, 
uh, one can, by good report and good deeds and, and faithful service, earn to himself a position or a degree within the church, like a bishop or a deacon. But, um, you know, <laughs> regardless, though, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, the Bible says uh, among, right? Peter said among uh, the 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 church of God. So, so we don't, so people don't rule over the church of God, right? That's not how God intended this, but we should certainly seek guidance, direction from brothers that have gone on before us and that kind of thing. But, uh, so, so number one, we'll, we'll knock that out. If you, if you've got a church that, um, that has the clergy ruling over the lay people, that's not right. That's not right. All right. Now, Next thing is uh, when you look at the context, I see something a little different. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse number 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas uh, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee the church, right? Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine uh, of, the, of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. It is possible that by context we're talking about the uh, using your liberty in Christ as a cloak of maliciousness, um, saying that you have liberty, meaning that you can continue in bondage to sin, certainly something else that God hates. God doesn't desire for his people to live in bondage to sin after God has delivered them from sin. So um, do, you, do we want to cover the birthday thing as well, or do we want to put that on hold? Brother Ed, um, you could go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You okay. can I answer mean, it, was it. Part of the thing. Uh, now she talked about this day, which I guess was kind of in, in close reference to Easter, Ishtar, whatever you want to call it. Uh, certainly not the the day of the resurrection, moving with the the phases of the moon, but uh, and the spring equinox and all that stuff. So we're, we're not. Going down that road specifically, but then she mentions the birthday of Jesus Christ. So, um, with regards to the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let's try and get this quickly. First Chronicles 24. First Chronicles chapter 24. And look to verse number... One, the Bible says, now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Uh, but Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office. And we read on, David distributes them uh, different courses of service by lot. And the Bible says in verse number seven, now the first lot came forth to Jehoharib, the second to Jediah, the third to Harim, the fourth to Seorim, the fifth to Malchijah, the sixth to Majamin, the seventh to Hakoz, the eighth to Abijah. Keep that in mind. The, seventh, uh, the eighth to Abijah, the ninth to Jeshua, the tenth to Shechaniah, the, twelfth, or the eleventh to Eliashib, the twelfth to Jachin, the thirteenth to Hupa, the fourteenth to Je Jeshabiab, uh, I suppose that's how you say those things. Who knows? The Lord might correct us on that. The 15th to Bilgah, the 16th to Immer, the 17th to Hezer, the 18th to Aphses, the 19th to Pethahiah, the 20th to Je uh, Jehezekiel, uh, the 1 and 20th to Jachin, the 2 and 20th to Gamal, the 3 and 20th to De Deliah, the 4 and 20th to Maaziah. These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded them. So God divided the priests into 24 courses, right? And uh, they served, from what I read, from what I understand, about a, a week's time, a Sabbath's time, from one Sabbath to the next. And they were all present on their holy days and uh 
the and, and let me say this right because before we go down this road our calendar has been manipulated to a degree how much who knows this is all going back to uh you know the the change with the gregorian calendar and who knows how accurate all that stuff is and, and i think that's part of the reason why the lord really doesn't give us his birthday Right? The Lord never says the Lord was born on such and such a day at such and such a time because you need to, uh, to remember that and, and make that a Christian holy day or anything like that. It's not his birth uh, that's as, uh, let, me, let me say this reverently, as important as his death and his resurrection. Right? His death and his resurrection is what pays for our sins, gives us salvation, assurance, hope peace with God, reconciliation. His birth didn't do that, though his birth is important. It's important that he came as a man. But uh, we'll now go to Luke. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter number 1. The Bible says in verse number 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. Remember that from First Chronicles 24? That is Abijah in the Old Testament, Abiah in the New Testament. That is the eighth course. And if you look at the way that thing goes on the Hebrew calendar, it's the eighth course. Uh, look down to uh, verse 19. Angels talking to get, uh, or the uh, angel is talking to uh, Zechariah, the angel answering, said to him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zechariah, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless. Now watch this. And it came to pass... That as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. So he didn't tarry, right? Being honest, God gave Zechariah a promise. He's going to have a son. He's an old man now. His wife is an older woman now. So he had thought this is impossible. God says all, all things are possible with him. And of course, he didn't say that in the passage, but it is. God is going to bring forth a son to Zacharias who is going to become John the Baptist. Now, verse 24, and after those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived and hid herself five months, right? So uh, verse number 26, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So Zacharias uh, goes home after the eighth course, the course of Abiah, and sees his wife right away, doesn't tarry, doesn't, doesn't mess around, and that would be in June if the calendars are correct. Then six months later, the angel goes to Mary. That would be December. And he's conceived. And nine months later, if the Lord had what would be a normal time, time in the womb, whatever you call that, nine months later it would be about September, right? So if anything, the Lord would be born sometime in, in September, not December. Nothing to do with the winter uh, solstice and his resurrection having nothing to do with the spring equinox. But uh, hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Let everyone be persuaded in their own mind. Again, uh, All right, I would you regard every man like. But Brother Ed, you can take that from there. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess um, I'll let Brother Mike say his piece. Brother, you got anything on that? Uh, well, let's start with the Nicolaitans. Um, the Nicolaitans are only referenced twice in Scripture. Um, both of them are in Revelation chapter 2. Um, the first time it's referenced is in verse 6, and then the second time will be in verse 6, 15. Um, the first one is... 
God pleased that they're not following the Nicolaitans. And the second one is a different church where God's not pleased because they are falling for the Nicolaitan doctrine. Um, the Nicolaitan doctrine is a church, is a, a laity, um, God's lordship doctrine. Um, Peter warned them, warned people in first Peter chapter five, um, verse three, um, I'm going to start in verse one, the elders, which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness mm -hmm. of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not a filthy, filthy looker, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples of the flock. There are many religions today that put rules and regulation and commandments and sacraments over their followers, putting them in submission, one to the church, two to the leadership of the church, and taking God's word completely out of it. That is not something God ever wanted to set up. God wants you to follow him 100%. I love my pastor, but if my pastor strays from God's word, I'm going to stay with God. I am not going to follow my pastor when he is not following God. He is not my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is He is the head of our church. He is the pastor of us. Amen. He's supposed to lead and guide us, but we're supposed to have our own relationship with God. My relationship with God does not go through my pastor. I don't have to do rules and regulations to be with God, to be pleased to God, because God's pleased with me. Um, so be careful of any organization, any church, any religion that has rules and regulations where you are being put into submission with over the of the church and not in service to God. Um, Justin did a good job answering that. I just want to add that to it. Um, the the birth of Jesus. It's common sense. God's word is very clear. God put the, the, the dates in there for a reason. God wants you to know that. Well, let me let me just go to another verse. Um, Ecclesiastes verse, chapter seven. Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse one. Um, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than a day of one's birth. Luke 2.11. Let me go to there. Luke 2.11, the angels are speaking to the shepherds um, in, in the field. Luke 2.11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That day, those angels were focused on what? The death of Jesus Christ, a Savior. They weren't focused on his birth. They were focused on what Jesus Christ came to do. Luke 2.11 is talking about a Savior. That baby in the manger is not the Savior. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, is the Savior. So way back in Luke 11, when Jesus was just a, a baby and the angels were coming to the shepherds, they were focused on the right thing. They were focused on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of his death is more important. People get caught up in this, what day was birth Jesus born? It doesn't matter. I, I want to celebrate the fact that Jesus came to this world. But I also, I want to focus on why he came into this world. He came into this world to die for my sin. He came into this world to die for Amen. your sins. For unto you is born today in the city of David, a savior. That is the most important thing you need to focus your mind on. He could have been born in August. He could have been born in September. It doesn't really matter. The fact that he was born is a fact. He died on our cross for your sins. Don't get caught up in genealogy. Don't get caught up in, 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 in trying to figure out when it is. If God wanted to know exactly what day it was, he'd have told you. December 25th is not the day. Um, it's, it's not the day. Do a little bit of research. Look up something called Tammuz, and you'll, you'll see that most religions have a sun god that his birthday is, is December 25th. But I'm not, we're not going to go into that tonight. Um, just, just keep in mind that the angels were focused on one thing. You need to be focused on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Brother Ed? Amen. Did you know Tammuz was a Nicolaitan? 
<laughs> I don't I don't know. I just said that. Um, certainly, uh, he uh, the people that uh, represent uh, Tammuz is try they're trying to draw disciples after themselves. Um, people that believe in all of these uh, pagan festivals and pagan practices um, would like you to know that they're harmless and um, that they're for the children and they're good for uh, society and culture. Um, but God has given us a word of God that we could discern uh, righteousness from wickedness. We could discern the things that seem indifferent in society, but that uh, really in the Bible displeases God. And I don't want to be indifferent to things that appease my flesh, but defile uh, my nature in my relationship to God. So um, I want to make sure that I'm I'm as right as I can be with God by studying the scriptures and knowing and discerning the difference between righteousness and wickedness. Did this Nicolaitans let's, let's do it. Be, uh, I'll just read you my notes here before leaving Ephesus. The apostle Paul warned of this error in recording the matter. The Holy spirit left us uh, with the truest definition of this error. Also, Quote, also of your own selves, not outsiders, not the ungodly, shall men arise. The trouble begins with the desire for an exalted position. Speaking perverse things. What could be more perverse than bidding men to submit to a man and not to Jesus Christ? To draw away disciples after them. Acts chapter 20, verse 30. When saints get away from God and heart, they naturally allow man to come in between themselves and him. The Hebrews of old asked Moses to stand between them and God, saying, let not God speak to us. Such is ever the way with those who have a desire for the good things God gives, but not for the giver himself. The principles of someone taking a place between the soul and God and the people standing at a distance is known today as the clergy ruling over the laity. Much blame for this condition lies with the church members as with their authority figures. Long ago, Jeremiah lamented that the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule of their means. And my people love to have it so. Jeremiah 531. Often when believers sit back and do not study God's word or take responsibility for maintaining a testimony for him, aggressive personalities take the headship of the church and alas, often develop into spiritual dictators with the consent of their subjects. Heeding this warning, the Ephesian church was commended for hating the deeds of these men. So according to Nicolaitan, some have said these were the heretical followers of Nicholas of Antioch, who was one of the seven chosen to wait tables in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Listen, listen, there is no proof of this. <laughs> it's just an opinion. Okay, your opinion is just as good as mine. I say, I say that's not uh, uh, who made up the Nicolaitans, okay? I, I, I don't think that's that's him. Okay, now, now who's right? Well, we don't know. There's not enough in the Bible to say either or. So um, it says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, if God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, does he hate the Nicolaitans? God hates the sin, but loves the sinner, right? But wait a minute. God hates the sin and hates the sinner. Which one is true? How about both? Both are true. He hates the Nicolaitans and he loves the Nicolaitans at the same time. Is, is God allowed to have more than one emotion? <laughs> See, because we allow ourselves to have mixed emotions all the time, correct? So yes, the Lord does hate people and he hates their sin. That's true. God hates all workers of iniquity. He not only hates the iniquity, he hates all workers of iniquity, Psalm 5.5. 5. God hates wickedness, Psalm 45.7. God hates idolatry, Jeremiah 
44, 4. God hates deception, Zechariah 8, 17. God hates false religion, Amos 5, 21. He hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet swift in running the mischief, those that sow discord among the brethren, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. And he hates lovers of violence, Psalms 11, 5. Just to list a few there. And the list includes individuals, Malachi 1.3, and it includes nations, Hosea 9.15. So his followers like David and the overcomers at Ephesus share his attitude toward hating every false way, Psalm 119.104. So, so hopefully, you know, we got something going on there that it's not, it's not, against the doctrine of God in the Bible that if the Nicolaitans would repent, that God would receive them. He would receive them if they repented. The problem is, is they're not willing to repent. And you can find that in the verse right before it. He's telling them to repent. <laughs> okay, so there it is. Uh, we want people to repent. Uh, we don't want people going down that road. But a lot of times people want to be in this group. They're in a group. They're, they're Come on. They're all called together Nicolaitans together. Not one Nicolaitan. It's a whole bunch of them. And they're all supporting each other <laughs> in this false way. So it's a, it's a hard thing to come out of a group of people that believe that they're right. And they're getting glory for what they believe is right. See that? And, and you got to get, you got to come out of that. You got to repent. All right. Let's do the second half of the question and then we'll close out. Uh, second part of the question about when is Jesus's birthday? Is it what, August or September? Uh, what about what about January? I was born in January. Why can't it be in January? Man? I mean, um, you know, I, I just think, I think it ought to be in January. I mean, why not? I, I mean, it's in January. If, you're not, if you don't believe it's in January, you're not right with God. Oh, see, see, I'm out of line, right? I'm out of line. So Guys, we need to stop arguing about these trivial matters. I mean, you can have an opinion and better yet, why not have your opinion based on scripture as close as you can? That would even be better. But a lot of times people, if they do get a stand based on scripture about their opinion, they want to force that opinion on everybody else. Well, if you don't agree with me, you're not right with God. You don't agree with me, you're not saved. Let's not be of those folks that do that, okay? Our, again, our fellowship is in Christ. Our fellowship is in the gospel of Christ. Why can't we read the book of Ephesians and get a proper understanding of our fellowship in Christ instead of arguing about all these trivial matters? So here it is. Why is it important to know when Jesus was born? As Mike said earlier, as Justin even said, it is not important to, it is not important. Again, let me, let me do it again. It is not important to God for us to know when Jesus was born. It is better for us to have a point in time when we are born again, not by Jesus's birth in a manger, but by his death on the cross and resurrection on the third day. We are never told in scripture to remember Christ's birth. However, we are told to remember his death on the cross. Emphatically stated, you can find it in 1 Corinthians. Jesus never celebrated his birthday. Come on. Jesus never, you already got a bad argument if you're arguing for everybody celebrating Jesus's birthday. If Jesus himself did not celebrate his birthday and I'm telling you he didn't celebrate his birthday and you're condemning me for not celebrating his birthday. What's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, the apostles never celebrated his birthday. Come on, show me that in the Bible. The early church never celebrated his birthday, unless you want to talk about Catholicism. Uh, the gifts that were given to Jesus was when he was around, listen, when he was around two years old in a house and not as a baby in a manger. That's when the gifts come on. Don't they always give you the argument that well, when Jesus was born, the wise men brought him gifts? No, they didn't bring him the gifts when he was born. They gave him those gifts like when he was two years old in a house. Read the Bible. <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Let's do it again. God says the day. Uh, Mike, Mike Basile just read this one. God says the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Ecclesiastes. So you, so, so listen, listen, listen I'm going to make it simple. And I'll, I'll kind of zoom in on maybe one instance that you could look at about the birth of Jesus. Okay. 
just one instance. I'm not going to hit them all. There's a lot you can go to. One of them is the Passover. You could determine the birth of Jesus based upon the accounts of Passover in the three and a half years of, of Jesus' earthly ministry. Just count the Passover. And you can work yourself to approximately, and I'm not dogmatic about this, around mid-September. Okay, if you did, if you worked that out by Passover in, in the Bible, in the in the four Gospels, <clears throat> then Justin uh, did this uh, uh, for you guys. And it was a, a great study. It was the course of Abaya. You could you could learn about around when Jesus Christ was born concerning the course of Abaya and then Roman taxing. You could learn about around when Jesus was born through Roman taxing. Just study secular history of Roman taxing. Now, let me give you let me give you a little one. Justin gave you one, and I'll, I'll try to give you one here. And um, again, Justin talked about the course of Abaya. I'm not we're not, I'm not going to go down that road. That's a really long road to travel on. But uh, it's concerning once you work out the course of Abiah, then you work out the birth of John the Baptist. Then from the birth of John the Baptist, you can count out when Jesus was conceived and count out those months out and it'll work you right into mid-September. Okay. Well, then remember I talked about uh, Roman taxing, Caesar Augustus taxing in December. Are you serious? There is no history of Roman taxation in, this, in December. See, you got you to gotta work this stuff out. So another thought, why is Joseph neglecting his wife? Why is Joseph neglecting his wife to be in the freezing cold when she is with child and travel in the wintertime? Come on, guys. Is Joseph a good husband or is he a bad one? All right. Now, what kind of shepherd is abiding in the field, keeping over their flock by night in the middle of winter? What kind of a shepherd is that? And you're telling me Jesus is the good shepherd? Jesus is the chief shepherd? And here you have an example of shepherds in the Bible that don't care about their sheep, that would let them go in the winter time, freezing cold. They wouldn't give them any shelter. What a bad shepherd that is. Why would Jesus is an example of a, a heartless shepherd? <laughs> come on, I got come on, you gotta say this stuff. Come on, come on, try to trigger the wheels going in the brain here. Come on. Let, all right. So let's do it. Let's do it. Here's the one I'm talking about. The baptism of Jesus in the middle of the winter. Amen. <laughs> Jordan frozen over. <laughs> Jesus is like, okay, you know, John the Baptist, go ahead, you know, kind of get an ice pick and pick a hole in that, in that ice and, and dump me in there so I can be freezing cold. <laughs> all right yeah i see that i'm sorry i guys you want to believe that jesus was born on december 25th have at it because i've dealt with people that no matter what you say they're going to believe that anyways because the the ways of this world the heathenistic practices a lot of times even with church brethren override they override the scriptures. They override their heart and desire to get right in the Bible and concerning scripture. So I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and argue with people about it. Look, I'll post stuff. I'll talk about stuff. But hey, if you don't want to believe that, that's fine with me. It's fine. Okay. So let me do it. Let me do this here. There's another indication in scripture as to when Jesus was born. Uh, Mark 1 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 1, 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and make sure you get my birthday right, because that's the gospel. <laughs> it's, it doesn't say that, okay? The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what he came for. So Jesus said this after his baptism upon emerging from 40 days in the wilderness. When he began his preaching ministry, the book of Daniel gives us the time or prophecy Jesus was speaking about. Now, look at Daniel 9.25. Look at Daniel 9.25. I'm just going to cover just a few things here, and then we'll close out. <clears throat> I wanted to hit this. Daniel 9.25. The Bible says, Know therefore and understand. 
that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's death, right? Cut off right there in the context means death, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice uh, and the oblation to cease. So it's very likely that by understanding this prophecy and date of the decree, when it began, the wise men knew exactly when to look for the Christ child. The 70th week of Daniel, a period of seven literal years, began with Messiah the Prince. Messiah means anointed, and Jesus was publicly anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism, Daniel 9, 26 to 27 tells us that Messiah would be cut off, which we said was crucified, in the midst of the 70th week, which is to say the Messiah would be crucified three and a half years after his baptism. Luke 3.22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my, my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age 30 years of age so luke hints that at his baptism jesus became about 30 so it was likely that his birthday coincided more or less with his baptism men could serve in the temple beginning at the age of 30 you can find that in numbers chapter 4 verse 3 so his baptism agrees with the time of tabernacles because three years and six months later at passover jesus was crucified exactly and precisely as daniel had prophesied in the midst of the 70th week knowing the year of his baptism from understanding daniel the wise men needed only to subtract 30 from it to know the year the Messiah would be born. Amen. <laughs> so there, there's another way you could determine it. See that? See how we did that? So if you're if you're going by scriptures, my friend, that's what's important. And a lot of times people ain't going by the scriptures. They're going by Tammuz. They're going by uh, Bacchanalia. Uh, festivals and stuff like that. They're going by the, the world. They're going by the Catholic Church. Look, I don't get anything that I deal with concerning honoring Christ or worshiping Christ from the Catholic Church. I don't get anything that deals with worshiping Christ or serving Christ from any other heathenistic practice. That's why it's such a shame when people don't receive correction from the scriptures concerning all of these unholy days. But if they want to celebrate these holy days, they want to observe these holy days, who am I to tell you what to do? I'm not going to tell you what to do. I just hope and pray that maybe one day as a Christian, you'll actually be a testimony to Christians and be a Bible believer and believe the scriptures over your heart and your emotions and your feelings and your and paganistic practices and the way you were raised by mommy and daddy and, and, and your uncle and your grandma. And we can get, get beyond this flesh. We can get beyond the culture of this world and be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, which doesn't deal with flesh. It doesn't deal with looking at the birthday when the body of flesh was born, but when Jesus Christ came in spirit, as well as soul, as well as body, and wanted us to get into the kingdom of God, which is the spiritual kingdom that lies within every person that believes on the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. It's spiritual. It's spiritual is what God wants you to have. When we get blessings, we get spiritual blessings. Can't we get this spiritual blessing today and correct ourselves out of these heathenistic ways? I hope we can. I, I believe that there are many um, that have turned their backs on heathenistic practices, but there's also many that will remain. They may be saved. They may have trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they will remain in the heathenistic practices and be a hindrance to a lot of other people that are saying, 
hey, aren't you a pastor? What are you doing still celebrating Christmas? We don't celebrate it anymore. <laughs> Why are you celebrating a birthday? Well, have you ever looked at the testimony of birthdays in the Bible? I don't, so I'm not going to go down that road, okay? But I, I know there's some people that still do that, and that's fine with me. But uh, but if you ask me, I, I, don't, I personally don't do it because I'm trying to line my life up everywhere in the Bible. So um, I hope that you guys can respect my side. This is, this is I speak for myself. Um, maybe my brethren here have a different views on that, and that's fine. And we can all agree that, that we have different views on that. But our fellowship, the reason why we can have disagreements or maybe even differences of opinion on these things is because our fellowship is always, always in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the finished cross work of what he did on the cross for us. That way we can all come up to our own persuasions concerning the scriptures and praise the Lord. At least each of us is persuaded concerning the scriptures and not uh, practices of the heathen and so forth. Okay. So there it is. Um, so I'm going to close out first and I guess then Justin will close out and then we'll let Mike get the last say, um, on the broadcast here. So I just say that again, um, you, you received my opinion on this stuff and I gave you some verses and I'm persuaded this way. Um, you can agree or disagree with it, but regardless, Regardless of whether you agree or disagree on what I believe Jesus' birthday is, or when I believe it is, or if you should celebrate his birthday, whether you want to say you say, I'm still going to celebrate Jesus' birthday, I'm still going to do Christmas. Well, okay, gr great, good for you. But what about your soul? Where's your soul going to spend eternity? And again, you could celebrate birthdays and all that, but if you haven't put your faith and trust in the reason of why Jesus was born and the reason why Jesus was incarnated in a human body of flesh, then you're still yet in your sins and you need to repent and put your faith and your trust that God for your sins and rose again the third day. And he is willing to forgive you of every sin you have ever committed past, present, and future. He, he's trying to reconcile you to himself. And if you believe on the cross work of Christ, you could be reconciled to God. The relationship that was lost in the garden can now be fixed between God and mankind, God and you, and eternal life. What a great life it would be if you had more than just this life on this, on this finite planet, in this finite body, you could have eternal life. You could have everlasting, eternal glory with God forever and forever. What a good thing that would be, but people pass this up all the time. And I hope that it won't be one of you um, listening. And I'll pray that uh, Lord willing, you'll make a decision soon sooner than later, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. Pass over to Brother Joe. Amen. Justin. Thanks, Brother Ed. And uh, thanks for good evening. Thanks for good time with the with the Bible, studying studying these matters out. I pray that you'd take a look at it with us. And, uh, you know, I do want to say, like Brother Ed said, for those of us that are saved, that, are, uh, that do participate, watch the broadcast, ask the questions, listen, our fellowship at the end of the day is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you if you have diverse opinions and thoughts on these other things, that's between you and the Lord. But if you're saved, you're my brother. If I'm saved, which I, I am, I called on the Lord to save me, I'm your brother. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'd encourage you, keep that in mind. Don't be, uh, don't be divided. Don't uh, let Satan get a hold of these things and, and mess up good churches. And, uh, and mess up God's people and the work he's doing here on the earth. So uh, anyway, I just want to encourage you in that. If, uh, if, you are, if you're not saved, man, you better get this stuff figured out because you are going to die and go to hell if you don't trust Jesus Christ. That's the most, most important thing you can do right now. Uh, second, after that, I'd encourage you to give your life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing better, nothing better in this world. And... Uh, and how much more will it be in the life to come? So thank you all. Have a good night. I can't reiterate it enough. The most important thing you could possibly do is to be saved. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He wants you to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. You can study the Bible your entire life, reject Jesus Christ, and go to hell. Uh, God's word is immense. We just answered questions from three different angles 
It's all God's <laughs> word. The more I study God's word, the more I realize that we're not limited to just one view. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different views of the same thing, but all leading to the same Savior. Trust me, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. If you're getting something from God's word, it's going to be true. But again, like Brother Ed said, but Brother Justin said, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. Right now, tonight, don't put it off. You're not promised another day. Please consider your eternity. Where were you a spent eternity? Brother Ed, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Um, ask questions, and y'all have a great and wonderful evening.